Okay, good evening. If you're standing at the door, please come in. There are some seats that I can see in between. You can sit next to each other. You won't bind each other. Maybe you will. All right, good evening. Assalamu alaikum. Um, shalom and peace be upon you. Um, I am Dr. Freely. I am Associate Professor of Religious Studies and Director of the Holocaust, Genocide, and Interfaith Education Center. And I'm really, really pleased to have Zarka Nawaz here with me. <clears throat> and before I introduce her, I wanted to say a few words about our programming as a center and what I hope to accomplish um, having um, wonderful lectures with, with people like Zarka Nawaz. So as some of you know, I teach Muslims in America, I teach Islamic studies at Manhattan College. And one of the things that we've been trying to do is to educate ourselves about Muslims, who we are, what we do, where we're from, and sort of look at the diversity of Muslims. One of the things I say in my classes is that we want to humanize the other no matter who they are. And especially in this climate, we talk about Muslims in America, Muslims across the globe. So, I bring you this program, and I bring it to you um, also in memory of 9-11, uh, which just passed on Monday, uh, because we should mourn the loss of all people on that day, including Muslims, Jews, Christians, secular, atheists, white, black, Latino, <coughs> you name it. We all lost something on 9-11. And I want us to understand that it was a loss for all of us. Muslims were killed in that building. Muslims also were killed rescuing lives, the heroes that we call upon on 9-11. So the Holocaust and uh, Genocide Interfaith Education Center, one of our mission and goals is to be inclusive of others, as the college's mission also states. But we also wanted to bring dialogue and exchange between Catholics, especially Muslims and Jews, on this campus. So this is one of the programs that hopes to do that, and also shed light on how we see Muslim Americans today around the world, um, but also how we see Islam and who we are as people. So let me introduce Arfa Nawaz. Before I do that, on November 7th, we have a very special woman Dr. Susanna Heschel giving a lecture, and she is uh, coming at 7 o'clock, and I think her title is Aryan Jesus, Bible, um, and the Nazis. Susanna Heschel is the daughter of Abraham Heschel. Rabbi Abraham Heschel was the man who walked with Martin Luther King in 1964, arm in arm. You don't want to miss that. This woman is just amazing. She has done a lot for her community, but also is a legacy that stands in front of people as a Jewish woman being the daughter of Rabbi Abraham Heschel, giving us the history in front of us. So I want to invite you to that. That's November 7th at 7 o'clock in Kelly Commons 5A and B. And in between you'll see other events that we're doing. A lot of them are around race and culture. Um, the next thing we have is on October 18th. We're showing a movie about James Baldwin, an amazing thinker, an American, African-American thinker, um, and it's called I Am Not Your Negro. That's at 7 o'clock on October 18th here in this room. November 2nd, we have a wonderful local reading group here in Riverdale that meets once in a while. And we're going to show the movie Grutka's Notebook about a young woman who wrote a diary like Anne Frank, and it's going to discuss her life, but also how we see this today and smaller camps all over Eastern Europe, especially in this case, Poland. So I invite you to all those events and you'll see more announcements for that. So without f further ado, I want to introduce Arka Nawaz, who is also Pakistani, like myself. However, she's Canadian, I'm American. Everyone, applause. <laughs> and um, I heard about her from uh, Fordham University. We tried to bring her, but we just couldn't make it happen, and I, I really wanted to advertise, so I invited her back. This fall, she lives in Regina, Saskatchewan, Canada, <clears throat> and 
She created the world's first sitcom about a Muslim community living in the West. And it was called Little Mosque on the Prairie, and I believe you can still see it on Hulu, she told me on dinner. Premiered to record ratings on the CBC in 2007. The show demystified Islam for millions of people around the world by explaining how practicing Muslims live their lives from dating to marriage to burying their dead. And now Nawaz has written her best-selling comedic memoir, which you can buy as you walk out or come in, laughing all the way to the mosque, about growing up as a Canadian of Muslim faith. She was not be being be beaten or stoned, so alas, she may be the most boring Muslim on the planet. <laughs> but her stories about going to Muslim summer camp are pretty funny. Nawaz is also a frequent public speaker on Islam and comedy, gender and faith, and diversity in the media. Let us welcome her with warmth. Street. <laughs> Just don't move, don't jump out at the wrong time. So actually I got here and I thought, wow, Manhattan, who knew, right? This is Manhattan and it was Manhattan. I was like, no, it's actually the Bronx. <laughs> I didn't know. Because I tell you what American, they name their institutions after different cities and put them in different places. It's always I actually got invited, you guys, to the Miami University and I was so excited. Like, oh, like Ohio. <laughs> and I was like, I don't understand. Like in Canada we we name our universities in the same cities that they're in. But anyway, and, I, and it's a full house, unbelievable, because my children are like, who, who listens to mom? Like, you're so boring. Now I think they take a picture of you guys and go, there are young people who, who will come out of their, you know, their house and listen to me and say something. Sorry, I'm trying to figure out the So where do I live? I live in Regina, Saskatchewan, the city that runs to fly. Did you guys watch Deadpool? He, 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 I think he's from Regina in that, in that superhero movie. And, Anyways, we're named after a queen of England, and I think it's Regina, for whatever reason, it's now Regina, and everyone's really embarrassed of you know, the name of our city, but Regina is a We're above North Dakota, if anyone wants to know where exactly that is. I'm a city slicker, I grew up in Toronto, but um, I moved, you know, because of circumstances to Saskatchewan, and my kids make fun of me because I always, you know, it's, it's where all the food, you know, where you get the wheat and the crops and the canola and the chickpeas and all that stuff comes from is a part of the country where I live in. So I pretend to know a lot about farming and I always talk about like, I always talk to the farmers in Saskatchewan to find out so I can tell you guys how the crop was this year. Like you're like, such a poser, like you know, you, you're not really you don't know anything about farming. You just say that. So I will let you know that I've heard it from the farmers' mouths that this year like, we had a drought in Saskatchewan, but there was enough water from the previous summer, which we had too much water, that the crops survived and it was better than expected. This year's wheat crops are better than expected. We will be able to eat bread <laughs> this fall. So I had it from the farmers. Yeah. So anyway, the, the real reason I'm here, other than telling really lame jokes, is to explain how someone like me ended up creating the world's first television sitcom about Muslims. And I have my very own Vanna White, who will press a button for me. But I will let you know, Robbie, I went to present. Okay, so my story, like, you know, who am I? Why am I standing in front of you guys, you know, as a brown woman in a hijab in the entertainment world? So I would say it really started back in 1947. And that was the year the British decided to separate. I wasn't born there, I'm a bad old. Really good. Brown skin never wrinkles, this is why. I would say black will crack them. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Anyway. Um, <laughs> Before that, Muslims and Hindus and Sikhs lived in relative peace in India. And of course, then the Brits came in and they, they do their thing in colonialism, and you know, you're probably learning about it in your classes. And overnight, the three religions became enemies to one another. And they, when they divided the country, my father's side lived in um, Ludhiana, in India, actually. 
And he said he grew up with Hindus and Sikhs, and they were all, you know, neighbors, and they knew each other. But when that day happened, it was like overnight, people became enemies. People that he grew up with families, you know, for, for decades they had been friends. <coughs> overnight, you know, people started killing each other, neighbors started killing neighbors, and they had to flee. And they had to leave their homes, and, and they had to leave everything, right? Like, everything about their lands, their jobs, their homes, sometimes even children. They had to just run because they were being slaughtered, and they lived in refugee camps. And then from the refugee camps, they got loaded into trains, and those trains, you know, were heading into the opposite directions. And my father said, we didn't even know if you'd arrive alive, because sometimes those trains would be stopped, and people would be wholesale slaughtered in those trains. At that time period, it was the largest human migration of its time. And so that's how we went, we went from India to Pakistan. And my father, he was the eldest son of, you know, like six brothers and sisters. And the culture at that time, make sure I don't fall, you guys. <laughs> Great face plant for you guys. But so what happened was he had to now help his parents raise his younger brothers and sisters because his parents were illiterate. And in that time period, if you didn't do something quickly to help your family, you would end up in, you know, indentured poverty very quickly because of this trauma of the move. And so what he, because it had been so traumatic, he felt that, you know, in life, every single thing can instantly be taken from you in a heartbeat, just gone like that. But the only thing that nobody could take away from you was education. It was so he became obsessed with education. And he got himself scholarships because his family couldn't afford education. And he went to university, and he became a civil engineer. And at that time period, the country that was looking for civil engineers to help rebuild after World War II was the very country that had caused the problem in the first place, which was England. And so he migrated from uh, Faslabad, Pakistan, to Liverpool, England. And he worked on, does anyone here heard of the Mercy Tunnels? The Mercy Tunnels. Um, I don't even know what that is, but it's a concrete thing <laughs> in Liverpool, England, that they needed concrete specialists. And so he went and he was one of the engineers to work in the Mersey Tunnels in Liverpool, England. And so he was making good money and he was sending every single penny back home to help you know, raise his younger brothers and sisters who were going through school, get them educated, get them set up, get them married. And he was in his 30s at this point. And so the villagers at home were like, you know, he's like a cash cow for the family. So what happens to him? Does he ever get a life of his own? And they're like, he won't come home, he won't, he won't get married, he won't do anything. He just, he's committed, you know, for the rest of his life to work and bring all the money back home. And so one day he gets a telegram, because in those days, not even phone calls from overseas, you would get a telegram, and the telegram said, your father's dying, you've got to rush back home. And so it was the first time after, you know, like a decade, he went back to Pakistan only to be greeted by a big band and a wedding and a shiny new bride. And this is what we call old school arranged marriage, where you don't even know you're getting married, much less who the bride is, right? And that's the way they did it back then, because they figured it was easier, nobody would you know, be complaining, it was just like you get married. And then I guess immigration was instantaneous, because then you could just go back the next week with a, with a new bride and, and parent, you know, people, your friends would be like, so how's your father? And he'd be like, the father's fine, this is my new wife. <laughs> and, <laughs> they took a picture of themselves. Can you, if I stand, I guess I should, that, so they took a, they got married so fast they didn't have a, have a chance to take a photograph of themselves, so they had to wait until they got to England and they got dressed up in their wedding clothes. So that's my parents. And then guess what happened a year later? <laughs> Aren't I cute? <laughs> that is why I am born in Liverpool, England, because that was the traditional route of migration at the time. And we're just going to press, um, yeah, we're going to get rid of me. Okay. We're just going to keep staring at me. I know, it's really good. I was a cute kid, don't you think? <laughs> so a year later, that I grew up in Liverpool. Well, I mean, I spent the first five years in Liverpool, in England, and then what started happening was, the British government decided they were, you know, there was too much Muslim migration happening in England and started making it much more restrictive. And my father wanted to bring other members of his family over. And Canadian immigration officers, they were looking for immigrants because they wanted professional immigrants to help rebuild their country and build you know, the infrastructure. And so they camped in England and they started saying, listen, we'll offer you a better deal if you leave England and come to Canada. We'll give you a job, we'll give you citizenship, we'll give you a place to live. Well, you know, your kids can go to university, you become Canadian citizens, and, and, and we'll help you uh, help your extended family come over from Pakistan. And so my father thought, this is a really good deal. So we migrated from Liverpool, England, to Toronto. And that is actually where I grew up because of the changing attitudes of migration and immigration policies. 
This was under the Trudeau years. If you, our Prime Minister today is the son of the Prime Minister that had brought over my family because he had enacted the multicultural policies where he wanted to bring, open up the doors for immigration. And so under his auspices, our family came to Canada. And so there, I, you know, I had two younger brothers. I was the only female in the family. And my father, as I mentioned to you before, was obsessed with education. And the number one goal for an immigrant father for his daughter is only one career. Can you guess what that is? Medicine. Medicine. <laughs> he wanted me to be a doctor. More than any other career on earth, that is the one that my father will obsess over. Because it means good money, respect. And as far as my father was concerned, never, you never need to get married. Because as far as he was concerned, men were the reason women failed in their lives. Because whenever he would see a woman, he would say, you know, what, why did you not get your BSc? If, you know, if she had a you know, uh, high school degree. And she, it was always because she got married. Or if you had a master's, why didn't you go on and get a PhD because she got married and had children? If you had a PhD, why didn't you go on and become the head of the economic forum at the UN because she had got married and had children? So for him, every woman failed. Her career stopped at the point where she got married and had children. So he decided that was what uh, held women back. And so thus, if you could become a doctor and make money and be financially independent, there would be no reason to get married because men are the reason women fail in life. So this is the way I was literally raised. It was like being raised by a very conservative Pakistani man who was like, Channeling Gloria Stein in the grave. And it was like, you know, it warps you as a human being, right? Because you're like, men are bad, keep away from them, and good education, avoid them at all costs. Of course, my mother did not believe that men were horrible. Her life had been a failure since you know, she married him. But she had to be quiet because he was obsessed. And she understood that he had come from a really, really, really traumatic background. And so this is where that fear was coming from. Money and education was like his mantra. So I did exactly that. I drank the Kool-Aid and I went to the University of Toronto and, <laughs> and uh, got a BSc. But it became readily apparent that I didn't have the talents that were required to become a doctor, that they had these medical school boards who would interview you and look at your marks and sort of filter people out that they felt would not be safe for humanity to, you know. <laughs> and so I was filtered out of the system, which was the most traumatic day of my life when I got the rejection form for medical school, because I had only been bred for one purpose on this planet, right? Become a doctor. No other career goal had ever occurred to me. And so I was just like, I don't know, I don't know. What am I going to do with my life? Like, I remember just thinking, this is it, it's over. My life is over. My mother, however, was like, finally, <laughs> we'll get you married. There's always a plan B. So suddenly all these guys started showing up in my living room, because they have this network of aunties, right, all from all over the place, like, we need a guy. <laughs> and you know, we lived in Canada, and of course, there were like, there's like universities all over the United States, and they all have these PhD students from Pakistan, and they just, all they need is a citizenship with benefits, right? And so they were like, if we marry her, we think that was a citizen. We don't care what she looks like. You know, we need to know, right? And so they would show up, and I was like, you know, serving them tea and eating smoothies. And I'm like, no, this, this can't be it. This can't be the end of my life, like just getting married. And of course, these guys would come on some sort of visa where they'd have to go back to Karachi and, and fulfill their work mandate because the government had paid for their PhD. And I was like, I, I can't wind up as a, a, like a housewife in Karachi after all this, right, after all this. So I thought, okay, I've got to do something. I've got to figure out my life very, very rapidly. And my best friend was always talking about a career in the arts, right, being a novelist or writing, you know, making films or, you know, working as a journalist. And those were like those sexy, <coughs> forbidden careers, right, that good Muslim women didn't do. Like, we don't go into those careers. We don't, like, wear lip gloss or, you know, like, sexy nylons. And we must even do those things, right? But it was like, there was no other option, right? I had to figure out a career very, very quickly. It, and the Ryerson School of Journalism was the only one that was still accepting application forms. And so I quickly, you know, sent my application form, and I got a request for an interview. And I remember sitting there really scared in the, in, in the interview room because I didn't have a portfolio. This was one of the best journalism schools like, in Canada. And I was you know, reading the, the women's magazines, and I was thinking, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? So the guy that he was an older man, and he let me in, you know, he sat, sat me down, and I said, you know what? You are the only applicant that we have with a BSc. Everybody else that applies, applies with a BA. This is really, this is why we wanted to see you. Why? did you apply to us with a science degree? And I said, listen, my whole life, I've always planned only one thing, and that is to become a journalist. And I knew the only way... <laughs> <laughs> the only 
only way I was going to get into the best journalism school in Canada was to stand out from everybody else. I knew everybody else was going to have a BA. Only I would have a BS. <laughs> and how was I going to compete? And it worked. He said, my God, it was my God. What incredible forethought has had no. <laughs> so can you please tell me something that you know you've learned in science that you could add to the journalism world? And I was thinking, I wish I had paid attention, right? <laughs> There's nothing that you learn in your BSc that is useful, you know, to mainstream media. All we all we ever learned in physics was like how to calculate rotating balls and their spheres and their, you know, what what area circumference, like what does that do for humanity, right? So I was like, oh my god, oh my god. So I thought I had just I had just uh, read the women's magazine, and it was like 1994, I believe, and they had just invented this this uh, revolutionary hormone birth control device called Norplant. At that time, women would take the pill every day, but then there was this thing that you you put in your arm, and it would release birth control hormones for five years, so you'd never have to take a pill again. It was revolutionary, and I said to him, listen, listen, they've invented this revolutionary birth control hormone pill. We learned about this in physics class. You still put it in the <laughs> It was, my God, that's incredible. If this should be in every women's magazine, and it would be right. It should be. I will write, I will write about it, right? Um, you know, his wife must have been menopause, because clearly he didn't know anything about birth control, right? So anyway, I got in, guys, I'm nothing. <laughs> the ability to tell a story, and that's what I knew I could tell a story that like nobody else could. It saved my butt. I got into the best journalism school in the country, and I started doing really well. And I started you know, writing stories about different things, and gradually what happened was I, um, I won an award for the best radio documentary in Stuart McLean's class. Who here knows who Stuart McLean is? Who here has heard of the CBC? Okay, so Stuart McLean was, the be Stuart McLean was one of the best you know, radio journalists in our country, and it was a really big deal to win the award in his class, and I won the best radio documentary in his class, and so I got to go to the award ceremony. And when I got there, they said, you know, they wanted to take a picture of me and Stuart together. And as the photographer got ready, my mother tapped my shoulder and she said, no, you can't have this picture with him. And I said, but why? And he's like, if a picture with you and a white man gets out, nobody will ever marry you. It'll be a scandal. <laughs> and I couldn't believe it. She actually made me move aside and put someone else in my place. And I thought, I have like waited for revenge. 20 years later, Stuart McLean came across the country doing a radio show, and I talked to the security guard. I go, listen, I never got that picture, and it's not fair. And so he, he got me through the, you know, in the green room, and he had me meet Stuart and Robbie up. I got my picture. <laughs> I was married now with my husband's problem. <laughs> so you can never, revenge is never a dish served cold. That's just like with your mother, it's impossible. So after that, I did really well in journalism school. And I was interning for CBC Radio, which is like NPR. Is NPR Radio? Is it NPR? It's like NPR. And then I felt like this creative energy was inside of me that I couldn't quite itch, right? It was just like, what, you know, what, something's missing. I, I, I can tell other people's stories, but I want to tell stories of my own. They're just stories. And so a friend of mine said, probably you should have gone to film school instead of journalism school. And I was like, oh my god, right? I have two degrees now, science degree and a journalism degree. I thought, cannot now go back to school and do a film degree. And like, the film is a different type of animal. You don't actually have to have a film degree. You just have to make a film. It's like plumbing. You can learn on the job. It's like an apprenticeship thing. So go take a you know, three-week summer workshop in filmmaking and see if you can do it, just five-minute film. And if you can make a five-minute film, you can make a longer film. So I thought, okay. So I enrolled in the Ontario College of Art, and they, they put us in groups of five students, like you guys, five students. So one of you would be the writer, right, of that team. One of you would be the sound person, the camera person, whatever else they do in film, right? <laughs> so, and, and we'd be put in groups, and then every person would get to be the director that week of the film that they wrote. So I was like, oh, what could I come up with? What's a good five-minute film? And it was 1995, and the Oklahoma bombing had happened. And every, um, all the newspapers around the country, they had Muslim suspects, right, that they were pulling off planes. And then I think it was two or three days later, they um, arrested Timothy McVeigh, who was a white supremacist, former um, you know, veteran, who was trying to bring down the American government. He was part of the, you know, the white supremacy movement that had been ignored for ages. 
and no one had seen this coming. And so he was trying to decide whether he should assassinate politicians or he should destroy a federal building. And he decided to destroy a federal building, knowing you know, that he would kill hundreds of people. And it, I believe that bomb destroyed I, it, there was even a daycare and children in there. I think at final count it was 167, 168 people. It was the biggest domestic <coughs> terrorism in, um, issue in that time period. And I thought it was really interesting, right? Because all the media focus had been on Muslims, and it turned out to be somebody else entirely. So I made a short film called Barbecue Muslims, where there's two Muslim brothers sleeping at night, and the barbecue blows up. And they're immediately um, arrested and accused of being Middle Eastern terrorists. And they're like, but we haven't even been to the Middle East. <laughs> like, we don't know, you know, who blew up our barbecue. It was just outside. And, and it just blew up. We don't know. And, but they're, where they got arrested. Meanwhile, there's a real terrorist group. And, and they're trying, they're, these guys, they're called Barf, um, Barbecue Anti-Resistant Front. And they're, they were against global warming. And so they were against barbecues because it gives off carbon, right? And so they're like, oh my god, like why why did we pick a Muslim's barbecue? All the barbecues in the backyards in suburban, you know, Ontario, why a Muslim barbecue? And then his, his friend's like, listen, they're not labeled. <laughs> <laughs> barbecues are economically, ecumenically neutral. We don't know if a Jew owes it or a Muslim owes it or a Buddhist owes it. We don't know. They're just out there and we just blow them up, right? If they were labeled according to religious ownership, we would never have picked a Muslim party. But now we did and now we cannot get attention to our cause. And so I used my brother, this is my brother and his best friend, these are all the neighbors. <laughs> and they're looking at the hole in the ground. And this was the picture that was given of the two suspects. And so the idea was that the idea of stereotypes and the othering of people is so powerful that it, it makes you not look at the truth and it can obscure the reality. And so I, you know, I thought it was worth an Oscar, right? Because I used yeah. the neighborhood and my friends. I submitted it to the Toronto International Film Festival. Have you guys ever heard of that film festival? Mm -hmm. It's like one of the most pre prestigious film festivals in the world. So a few months later, a very irate man calls me from the programming department, and he says, I cannot believe I'm going to say this, but we are programming your film. And I said, why? Like, why are you? He said, I'm very upset. He goes, there are so many people with technically perfect films, and we are rejecting one of them for you. <laughs> <laughs> but we cannot ignore the fact that there's just nobody else out there making satires about terrorism. <laughs> and I didn't even know what a satire. I thought I had made a very serious film, a very serious issue about stereotyping. But all the audience was just laughing, and they were hamming it up, and you know, the actors were hamming it up, and they kind of knew that there was this comedic edge to the film. And so then I thought, wow, this is amazing. Like, I can make satires about you know, very serious subjects. So the Toronto Film Festival was like, we'll give you one shot at this, right? We'll let you in. This is very prestigious. But we expect you now to go back and get more money and to do a better film. So then I thought to myself, what can I make next? And because I had had this film be successful, I figured I could now cobble together more money to make a better film and hire real actors and a real crew. And so I put together, this is back in the early, the, late 90s when, when there was no such thing as video or HD, it was all film, like real film, which was very expensive to make. It took about $30,000 to make a 20 minute film. And I called it fatwa. No, wait, I call it death threat. I wanted, I wanted to call it fatwa, but people kept saying no one would be able to pronounce it. So, I call it death threat. And it was about the whole, uh, you guys are so young. Do you know who Salman Rushdie is? Yeah. Do you? Oh, you know what? He lives in New York. Speak. Pardon me? He Does he live here? You know what? I talk to young people and audiences like this, and a lot of people don't know anymore <laughs> who he is. Probably most of them don't. Do you? Okay, he's a writer, and he wrote a book called Satanic Verses. And he got a death threat from the Ayatollah in Iran, I believe it was the late 1990s. So I'm taking off my jacket because it's kind of warm, but it's like not working too well. But it's right. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to do that with like elegance, but no. Anyways. It's okay, I don't want to pass out from the heat. Can I get water? Yeah, right. Oh, is there? Oh, can we open that? Right? Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, so I thought to myself, that would be a really interesting subject to do, because the media was obsessed with Salman Rushdie, and all the, all the information about Islam and Muslims was about death threats, how we wanted to kill writers, and we had no patience for writers, and this and this and this. And I thought, let's do a funny film about fatwas of death. And so I had a writer in the film you go to the next one. It'll be a, this one isn't such a great poster. It was called Death Threat. So a young Muslim woman writes a really schlocky romance novel, and she can't attract a publisher at all. So she decides to get a shortcut to fame 
and get a frontal wall of death on purpose. If she could just upset the Muslim community <laughs> enough, they consented her to death, and then she, that'll be enough to get notoriety and a publisher interested in her. So she goes to the mosque and starts breaking it and vandalizing it, and like you know, doing all sorts of horrible things at the mosque. And the mosque community is like, "Can we help you? Should get you a psychiatrist? She's in trouble." <laughs> and she's like, "Damn it, this is not working." So she decides she needs an authentic terrorist. So she reads in, in the newspaper that um, um, you know there's. At the local university, there's a member of the Hamas coming to speak to everyone. And she's not, and only men are invited, right? She goes, oh my gosh, perfect, right? I'll get one of them. And so she types up her death threat. She figures she's worth at least $3 million for bounty on her. And then she goes there, she wears in a gap so nobody you know, can tell who, <laughs> tell who she was. So she gets there and she finds out that she has misread the sign and it wasn't a member of the Hamas coming to speak. It was actually a cooking class for homeless, right? <laughs> <laughs> for men only who are too afraid to learn in front of women. <laughs> so she decides to salvage the day, and when the chippy delivery guy comes, she pretends that she uh, is signing for them and sends it, sends it and pays them off, and then she, when the, guy, you know, the actual guy who's teaching the chippy class, the homeless class, opens the door, she gives him the death threat, and he thinks he's signing for the chickpeas, and before she knows it, she's got her own death threat, right? So it was a comedy, this was a comedy, that got, get, this was the next comment that got invited to the Toronto International Film Festival, who were, who were much, much relieved at the higher production values. So I realized I had this ability, right? I had this ability to tell cookie t tales about Muslims. The next one I made, it gets kookier, but don't worry. <laughs> Random check. So this was about a Muslim guy on his way to meet his um, bride for the wedding. He was en route and he gets random checked and you know, sent to a Canadian prison where he's being held you know, for torture, and he's like, how am I gonna, you know, and his fiance thinks that it's just, she's, she's, he's getting cold feet and saying he got random checks, he doesn't want to actually marry her, he's like, no, no, this is true, this is true. And in, in typical Canadian fashion, we always have, you know, a lot of government oversight over all our institutions. Like, unlike Americans, we have a hysterical belief that government should be involved in every aspect of our life <laughs> fully, and anything goes wrong is the fault of the government. So he realizes he can use this, um, to get out of jail, because one of his uh, his roommate doesn't have a one armed man, because he took too many drugs. And if you take too many drugs, you guys, you get infections, and you'll chop your arm off. And, you know, this is what, you take anything home from this lecture. Lose <laughs> 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 your arm. So he's with his one armed druggy prisoner, right? And then you know a documentary film crew comes and films him, and then he starts to act like a real terrorist, well, I'm a real terrorist, and they don't feed us properly, I have to eat his arm. <laughs> and then the next scene is the Canadian Food Services, right, Regula regulatory, going, what? What is happening here? We are not feeding the, the prisoners properly, that they should be eating one another, that they sent an investigation team, and that's how we, that's, it's a very Canadian film, right? That's how he gets out of jail. Anyways, that was the next one that I made. <coughs> Fred's workout, this was... This is all, be, you know, this is before the whole Nagab hysteria, right? So Fred is this two-time, you know, criminal who always has a loan shark after him. So he, the loan shark is on, on his way, and he needs to get money really quickly. So he has to, you know, um, hold up the local 7-Eleven. But his, what do they call it? the nylon that you put over your head? It rips at the wrong time. He doesn't have any extra, and he doesn't have any money to buy more. But luckily for him, his next-door neighbor wears a Nagab, and she's hanging it to dry because she washed it. And he's like, oh, my God. These are perfect for like heists, right? Because they're like long robes and face coverings, like what you know. These are perfect. So he steals her niqab and goes to the local 7-Eleven and tries to hold it up. But you know, it's there's a young Somali man who's you know running the cash register, and so she sees this person in niqab who's you know flailing away because he because Fred can't get the gun out because the robes are too big, right? <laughs> <laughs> but so he thinks it's a beautiful woman that's come to propose to him, right? And he's like, I accept, I accept your proposal, right? And he's like, no. And so he runs away, leaving his flip flop behind, which gets picked up by the young Somali man going, you know, I have to find my Cinderella. <laughs> and so he goes home, only to be attacked by the loan shark, but the Somali guy who's coming to save his you know, fiance rescues him. So anyway, this was my nigab comedy. So I was rescued from this insanity of making hilarious, what I thought was hilarious short films by the National Film Board of Canada. So they were like, yeah, you know what? We know you can make cookie films. This is obvious to us. But what we would like is for you to pick something serious. Do something that actually matters like deeply to you as a woman, as a Muslim woman. And I thought, well, what could it be? And at that time period, I was living in Saskatchewan. And we had a mosque where you know, women and men prayed in the same hall. And then we had this imam from Saudi Arabia come. And their culture is very sort of patriarchal and more you know, misogynistic. And they felt that um, 
women shouldn't be seen in the main prayer hall. They should be in the back with the curtains. And the men, you know, believed in because they mixed up, you know, Saudi Arabian traditions with theology. And suddenly, I came to the mosque one day, and there was a curtain, and we were asked to pray behind it. And I knew this was wrong. They had nothing. It had no basis in faith, because people always say it's some, you know, this is based on literal interpretations. But to me, you can't be literal if it doesn't even exist in literature, right? That it's just, it's just <laughs> kind of like made up and cultural and patriarchal. And but I wanted to prove it to the community because they felt that this guy had, you know, because he was from Saudi Arabia, somehow they had like this, you know, at that time period anyway some sort of authority. And so I did a documentary where I went and I interviewed like the most senior you know, scholars in the Muslim world. And they all said the same thing. This is Darek Swaydan, for those Muslims who, who might know him. And they were all unanimous. Like during the time of the Prophet, you know, peace be upon women were never behind curtains. Um, you know, up in balconies, they were the same space as the men and they would actually stand up and speak in the mosque if they heard something that was wrong. They would put their hand up and say, no, you're wrong to the guy who was giving the sermon. And so those things have changed over the centuries where misogyny and patriarchy and these you know, um, very restrictive cultures have come in and, and redefined faith. And so I wanted to sort of examine why that happened. So I made a documentary called Me in the Mosque. And that was the idea when I thought, started thinking to myself, what if the imam came from a culture that was more you know, concerned with you know, gender equity? How would the idea of the mosque change, the definition of a mosque change? And then the idea for Little Mosque in the Prairie happened. And this was, for those of you who aren't familiar, I pitched a show, to, I pitched a television show to CBC, and they loved it because Islam and Muslims were in the zeitgeist. And it was about this guy, who, who here has seen the show or knows something about it? Does anyone know? So, okay, so, okay, so it was a television show in Canada. So this is Amar, he's the imam. He used to be a lawyer in Toronto. He gets an epiphany and he decides he wants to run a mosque. And the only job he could find is this tiny little broken down um, building in Saskatchewan, right? And it turns out that it's actually in a church because the church is losing membership and they don't have enough money to pay rent. So they rent out space in the church. So it's a, it's a mosque in a church in the middle of the prairies. And these were all the characters of the show. And so we were making the show and all of a sudden we got all this attention. In Canada, we have, uh, until the show aired, we have never had success with sitcoms because we basically watch American shows because you guys have the big budgets and the big shows and you know your country of 300 million, we're a country of 30 million, and you, you just have the revenue where you can, because television shows are very expensive to produce. And so up to this point, we couldn't get Canadians to even know, even if we put on a show, they would fail because Canadians didn't know they were on. We just didn't have the ad dollars. But, but all of a sudden, the Americans started paying attention when we were in the New York Times and CNN because what was happening is, this is 2006, we're developing it, and 2005 was when the Danish controversy happened and the, pro the, car the cartoons of the prophet had um, happened and there was violence and people thought, oh my God. So the first show about Muslims isn't even going to be like a Cosby show with like a couch in the living room. It's going to be a comedy set in a mosque about religion. They go, Canada is insane. Muslims will go crazy and blow up the building. And they're, so they're waiting for Canada to sort of basically blow up for making the show. So they're all covering us. They're literally all camped out, covering us. And then the Canadian media started paying attention. Why is the American media paying attention to these guys? And so suddenly we got all this attention from media that we could never have afforded before, right? And that gave us enough um, advertisement that we had, when we aired, we had record we had record ratings. The CBC, which would be the equivalent of PBS, hadn't had ratings that high since 20 years earlier. Since uh, there's a show called um, Green Gate, Anna, Anna Green Gables from Avonlea. Have you heard of that? Have you heard of her? So there was a series from 20 years, but now I think they've remade it a few times. So it just like it, like, re it changed the whole landscape of Canadian television because it gave the sense of we can do this. We have the confidence to make our own shows because it wasn't with white people. It was essentially you can see a minority cast. I think seven of them were Muslim. And it proved to the network that you could make a show with a diverse audience, with a diverse cast, and then audiences would be willing to watch it if it was good storytelling. And so the world was paying attention, but who was really paying attention was Europe. They started buying this show and drove, I think 60 countries um, wanted the show. And, but they were watching it for a very different reason, because I had created it because of you know, my issues with patriarchy and I wanted to talk, up, talk about gender equity. But they wanted to watch it because they couldn't believe there was a community of Muslims living among white people and everybody was educated and integrated and living together as their <coughs> neighbors, right? And what I had inadvertently done was exported the whole issue of multiculturalism to Europe, which wasn't used to that. 
I didn't understand it. Because I guess the easiest way to, the, the easiest an analogous is when you have a minority community that's not doing well. Um, like for example, in Canada, we have, we've had cultural genocide of First Nations people. I think here you would call First Nations people Native, Native Americans. Americans. We call them indigenous or First Nations, right? So we have had a history of cultural genocide in Canada where we have ripped, we take them away from families and try to colonize them and take away, take away their language and their history and their religion and try to force them to integrate and all of a sudden is you know, a destruction of a community. And so it's very analogous to what's happening to the Muslim community in Europe. For example, in Germany, after World War II, they needed immigrants to rebuild their country, and so they brought in Turkish immigrants. And they said to them, you're going to be here as temporary citizens, not as real citizens. We're not going to put you in the main cities. We're going to let you live in you know, houses outside of the main cities, and you're going to go away after a few years. And what ended up happening was, so there was no plan to integrate them. So, but the thing is, they didn't finish working after a few years. They stayed for generations. And their kid, they got married, and they had children, and those children's children didn't get citizenship. So you had millions of, you know, German kids who were of Turkish origin who had no upward mobility, no way to go to university, no way to get better education, and so you had this, you know, millions of people who were, you know, in indentured poverty. And so Europeans started to believe there was something about Muslims they just couldn't. They couldn't um, adapt, they couldn't integrate with their religion, it was their skin color, it was them. Yet in North America, Muslims, you know, both in Canada and, and in the United States, have the same level of education, the same level of employment. In fact, they're probably higher than average and are well integrated in living in cities. You know, there are like Muslim ghettos that you have in Europe. And so they couldn't understand the differences between the two systems. How is it that Canada and the U.S. was able to integrate a Muslim community and they were not? And it was because of the policies that were in effect in both countries. That Canada, and I can speak as a Canadian, had a policy of multiculturalism where, where when the government came to my father, they said, we will give you a job, we will give you citizenship so that your children can go to university and then they will be, an, you know, they will be a route to upward mobility. And so that changed the whole history of how immigrants were able to assimilate and integrate into North America. Whereas this is something that Europe has not <coughs> done well and has had a very difficult time with and now these problems that we're seeing are huge. And, they, and, they, and there's a root cause for these problems in terms of how immigrants are integrated. Which comes us back today, you know, um, you guys have a new president and, and I understand like the challenges, but what I see, I see a lot of the same things that happen in, what are happening in the United States today that happened to my father in 1947, where people who have lived together in peace for a long time can suddenly other one another, and people can be seen as a threatening force in the country, even though they've been there forever, and they've been part of the fabric of the nation, and how you can take you know, people's differences, and you can exasperate make them to you know, result in the problems of violence and distrust that you see today. And, 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 and I guess my, my message is that it's a very serious issue because, I, I mean, I come from a country that was destroyed because of that whole belief system of other different persons, um, religion, and ethnicity. And you think that it's not serious, but in a heartbeat, it can change your whole country overnight, and it could be over. And that social cohesion is a very delicate um, balance that we all have to work hard at to maintain and to get to know one another and to learn each about, about each other's stories. And one of the reasons I made this show was because up to that point, the only Muslims you ever saw on television were like terrorists or the ones who were disrupting the country. Nobody ever saw the other 99.9% .9 of the Muslims who are living like ordinary people, having ordinary jobs, paying bills, raising kids, having mortgages, that are the majority of Muslims. And when you have that image of a community that we only show the violent fringe, then you end up othering it and making them seem like they are the threat. And Islamophobia is at its highest levels historically ever. Right? The most distrust is about the Muslim community. We've seen the first mass murder of Muslims in, in Canada, in fact, in Quebec, where a, a shooter went in who was inspired by sort of Trump's ideology and went and shot Muslims because he felt that you know, they were a threat to his country. And so the rate of violence um, is escalating you know, among people of color, and it's, it's a huge problem. And it's a problem that I feel that we can all solve by talking to one another and getting to know one another and to 
stop distrusting one another and to hear each other's story and realize that at the end of the day, you know, this is what, when people watch Little Moss on the Prairie, the thing that they told me that, that I had never even considered was that, you know, I had white people say, you know, this reminds me of my church. These people, these are the same people in my church. These are the same people in my synagogue. These are the same people in my soccer association. These archetypes exist any place where you have organized human beings because human beings all act in the same way, right? You've got your matriarch, you've got your patriarch, you've got the rebellious teenager, the person who's trying to you know, solve the problems, the optimist. These are all universal traits of every human being. So any organization that you get, you're going to get these characters. And so what they realized was they were watching this show and it helped them connect to Muslims and it helped them connect Muslims to people that they already knew in their own communities and realized there was actually no difference. Right? This show could have easily been about, you know, seven people running a university. Like it would have been the same, except, except that we had just changed the setting and it was a mosque. And so I, that really surprised me was that people actually watched the show and it helped them relate to their own people more and help them humanize Muslims, even though we are human, in a way that had never happened before. Because you had never seen Muslims being depicted as ordinary people. And that's why it's important for all of us here to tell our own stories and to have people hear what those stories are so they can connect to each one of us. Because we need to have that human connection to create empathy and sort of get rid of that fear of the other. And I have a way of babbling on, so I know that you guys must have questions. I can just go on and on, on, right? So why don't we stop, let the lights up, and then we can talk to each other, right? getting blank index cards and you're looking at them and going, what, what am I supposed to do with this? So if you could just quickly jot down a question and Cami and Rhea will come on the sides to collect the questions and we'll take a few. If you have one right away and you know you can articulate it, go ahead. Can you tell us what the story of the film is, the, the mosque on the prairie? What is the story? So the story is the Imam, he was a lawyer in Toronto, so he gives up his job as a lawyer and he wants to run a mosque. And so he sees an advertisement in the newspaper, and there's this mosque, this tiny little mosque in this church that's looking for an Imam. And he applies and he gets it, he's the only one who applied. And he doesn't realize there's absolutely no salary because they have no money. So he goes there, and he ministers to a group of Muslims who are living in a church where a group of Christians, and they live in a town where they have a really racist radio um, shock job who is always trying to create problems for the Muslim community, saying that they're a dangerous force, they're going to destroy our society. And so it's a community that's dealing with a wider community. So it's relationships with each other, Muslims with, between each other, Muslims with Christians, Christians with the wider world. So it's a community comedy. And if those of you who are interested, it airs on Hulu in the United States. It was unavailable in the United States until recently. And you can see the whole series on Hulu. Does that make sense? So it ran for six seasons in the 91 episodes. I think Muslims are generally aware of this show. Yeah. <laughs> if you have questions, give them to either one, one of them. Bria, Kelly. Pencils? Yeah, there's one right there. Can you grab that? Um, had it not been for journalism school, I, had it not been for journalism school, what would have been your alternative to your backup, I guess? I don't know. I wanted to tell stories. I didn't know what... When you, when you come to the world of story, it's hard, right? Because yeah. I didn't understand what it took to write books or make films or make television shows. It was sort of a big, mysterious blog because I had been in the science world for so long. So it took me a while to sort out my, my journey. And this is what I like to tell people who are on a journey to become X and they have to become X or they have to go to this professional school. You think if they don't make it, you know, the horrible things will happen. And I'm your, your living proof that just because you don't get in to the professional school of your dreams, but it doesn't mean it's the end of the world. It just means that there's another path for you and you just have to follow it and just keep going. You have to be like sharks, you guys. You just have to keep moving forward. Don't stop and don't despair and don't worry that there's your path and you just have to discover what your path is. And you would be surprised. And that, then a million years, if one of you had told me when I was 18 that I was going to be a television writer, I would have never believed you. Never, never. And you know, it just surprised me to this day that this is where I wound up given my background and my history. Um, okay, I have two questions here. If you have a question, raise your hand or put it on an index card. If you need a pencil, we'll bring it to you. Um, how did you meet your husband? 
Okay, this is where I wrote the book. It's a long <clears throat> chapter, it's a long, complicated chapter about how I met him. Basically, the, the Coles Notes version is my brother wanted to marry someone white, which my mother, I mean, no offense to white people, but my mother <laughs> considers that the greatest tragedy of her life, right? <laughs> <laughs> she just thinks that, you know, white people, it's just like, it's, you know, it's going to be, I don't know, how, how, do you, how do you explain it? Like, you're going to lose your culture, your religion, your way of life, and, you know, they pass off boiled vegetables as well, cuisine, you know, like, the things like that. <laughs> <laughs> it just, just kills her, right? So, my brother had to, like, now, my mom's like, but my mom was Punjabi, and from the tri you know, tribal villages of Pakistan, where it's considered a dishonor for a son to get married before a daughter, even if the daughter is older, which I think because the rumor will spread in the village that she is deformed. And then the ma ma matchmaker will never be able to get her married, right? Because they passed her over for the son. And so my mom said, until she gets married, you will not get married to this white woman. And so my poor brother was like, yeah, but she's not attracting any guy. Any guy, true. Just true. I was very nerdy. And, I, I, and plus I was raised, you know how I was raised, right? I was scared to death of men. So I didn't know how to flirt or how to express any interest or have them. <laughs> You know, like me, how do you do that, right? How do you attract a man? I don't know. I was, you know, I was taught to like fear them with every fiber of my being. So I was getting nowhere on the romance department. So my brother found a friend. You know, he had a network of friends. Like my mother had the aunties. He had his friends. He called them all. He found a guy in northern Saskatchewan, like seven hours north of like where we live now, doing his um, medical school residency. And someone called him and goes, would you like to get married? And he was, of course, not meeting anyone, like, you know, seven hours north, probably living somewhere close to the Arctic. And he's like, yeah, yeah, I'd like to meet someone. And like, we have the right person for you. And so he called me one day, and he's like, so do you want to, you know, hang out? <laughs> My God. And I was like, sure. And, and then he said, well, I'll be there in like 10 weeks. <laughs> and I was like, 10 weeks? Meanwhile, my mother was like, all these Mosa boys were coming every week. And I was like, I was like, no, you, you have to come now. And he was like, I can't, I can't. And it was this horrible thing where I had to wait for 10 weeks for him to show up. And then, you know, we got to know one another. So it was, it was a long, torturous thing. But because my brother wanted to marry a white woman, I got married to a brown guy. And then, of course, and then of course, as life would have it, my brother and Suzanne divorced. Oh. And of course, and my, with my mother, who, who believed this was going to happen, because that's what happens when you marry white women, right? Because they don't have any of this woman. Because she was like, she, she was like, because she believed that, you know, like brown women will stick with you no matter what. Right? <laughs> white women will just leave the first sign of trouble. So her marriage advice to my brother was like, listen, you've been married here for 25 years, right? You're going to be dead in another 25. Just, just keep going. Right? And, and that's her idea of marriage advice. So anyway, it didn't work. Anyway, so my mother's prediction of, turned out to be true. So. He's on his second white wife, though. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, she's white if she's going to get tr in trouble with, for this. Um, no, she's not. not. So um, I'm going to combine a few questions and ask you a thematic question. Is how can non-Muslims help in, um, in issues of Islamophobia, sorry, I'm trying to combine five things, issues of Islamophobia, and when non-Muslims hear stories about Muslims and Islam in the media, how do you, how do you deal with these preconceived notions? What do you do with that? It's, it's a good question, it's, and, and, and it's a fair question. I think there are two sides to that question. Um, part of it is the Muslim fault, which I fully admit, because we have had parents who have been obsessed with medical school. So traditionally, we've all become very well-paid doctors in hospitals. In entire hospitals, we could probably just speak with food and get away, get away with it. And when you do that, and you abdicate your responsibility for creating an image of your own community, if you don't do that, then somebody else is going to create that image in your absence, and they're going to do it based on stereotypes, right? And that's what's been happening. So you get shows like Sleep, Sleeper Cell or Homeland, or you know, where it's just if there's a Muslim, it's got to do with terrorism. It has got to do with real life. And if, you know, I think there's a book called Real Arabs by Jack Shaheen, who just passed away. And it was a this book. He documented every film produced in Hollywood, and of like a thousand Hollywood films, I think eleven or twelve of them had positive depictions. So when you have an entire industry that's pumping out only one image of your community, and it represents like, you know, 1% of your community, 
what then that what you believe is the whole community is a threat and it has been other. And it's a huge problem. It's a huge problem. And then it becomes easy to you know to bomb or have drones in Muslim countries and nobody complains because they're not really human and they're like savages and they're uncivilized and we have to go in there and make them better because they're so terrible to their women. And, and so you actually believe that, right? And and we have used this to colonize so many people, right? right? First Nations were colonized because they needed to be civilized and they had, their culture had to be destroyed and they were reinvented, you know, in the colonizer's image. And so it's it's, a, it's typical to other, you know, to other uh, an entire community this way. So you know, you can bomb Iraq for weapons of mass destruction that don't exist. One third of this country's population is either dead or injured or exiled for no reason, like no reason, right? And and the reason that there's not this huge global outcry is because people look at Muslims and say we're well, not really truly human anyway. They're really just like barbarians who deserve to die. And when you do that for decades and decades and decades, that's what happens. You can get away with a lot of murder. And it's been happening in the Muslim world. And so now, so Muslims have sort of woken up to that and realized that, you know, if we want to change our image, then we're going to have to do the work. And so you're seeing now this renaissance where Muslims are going into novel writing and television writing and filmmaking and you know, writing plays and sort of creating this world of culture. And we learn from the Jewish community because they also suffer from the exact same thing of being othered, right? The people that couldn't be trusted. And they realized that they too had, they wanted to have people look at them as humans and they had to go out and project that image on their own terms. And so Muslims have learned a lot from the Jewish community about doing that. So now you're seeing comedians and people on television, you see Aziz Ansari and Austin awesome Kamanbi, and you know, you've seen Muslim women who are writing and being actors. And, and so you're seeing a change. I mean, it's slow, it's very slow and difficult, but the whole issue of diversity on the media is already becoming very popular, right? And I think that shows that Little Mosque were one of the shows that spearheaded that movement of diversity in the media. To get to Hollywood to pay attention to, you can't keep regurgitating the same images because it's very harmful for this community. And we're seeing you know, that harm come out in the battles you see every day. But I mean, I have great hope because when you know, Trump enacted the travel ban, you know, who was it? It was the non-Muslims who came out and were protecting Muslims at airports, right? I mean, before that day, I was too afraid to pray at an airport. And, and Muslims were praying in safety because they felt there were people there supporting them. And I think what Trump has done is he's reignited the whole civil engagement movement, right? that people care now deeply about these issues because they, these issues are vital to our survival as human beings. And I, I don't think there's ever been a time where I've heard people talk about Black Lives Matter and police, police brutality. I mean, those are issues that are finally coming to the forefront of you know, consciousness in Canada. You know, the, the cultural genocide of the Muslim, the, the First Nations community is a huge issue in Canada. We've just published the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. If anybody's heard of that, just Google that and find that document. Just read that the first page and it'll just blow your mind away, right? In terms of what happened to this entire community of indigenous people in Canada. And I mean, we need to start talking about these things, like the fact that I'm here today, the fact that this is a full house that I've never had so many young people come and hear me speak, which is incredible, which means you care. And you want to learn about these issues and we want to engage with one another and talk about each other. Talk about images matter, stories matter. You know, these things all resonate and they, and they have incredible you know, longevity in terms of how we react to one another, how foreign policy is created and, can, and you can get away with all sorts of things. I mean, if, if you look at the, the Muslim minorities all over the world in China and what's happening in Rohingya, right? How is it that you could, I mean, and these are, these are Buddhists, not that I have anything against Buddhists, but whenever you think of Muslims and Buddhists, you think Buddhists are the peaceful ones. They're not, you wouldn't think that they're beheading children, right? But this has been going on for how long? And this general, you know, cultural genocide, which kind of washes over people in the media because it's just Muslims and their problem, and we don't really believe that they're human. They kind of probably did something to deserve it. You know, that attitude, like, makes it easier for countries to, do this sort of behavior because they believe that nobody really cares. And so we have to start caring about all of us. Right? Each one of us you know, is a valuable human being. Each of our lives are equal. You know, one life is more equal than the next one. And we need to do that. And I think we have to learn and come together. I think this is like what this is really empowering for me to have so many people listen to me. Um, OK, I'm going to ask one more question about sort of immigration. Um, the question is, with Trump's attitude toward immigration, do you foresee an immigration increase in Canada? Number one. <coughs> and then I think the, the rest of the questions are asking, what does your father think about your success? That's a personal one. And the last one is, how can we see your movies? 
My movies are finally on my website. I was, the only reason I left to have children to this day is IT. <laughs> 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 like, I'm not of the generation for IT, so I just print these like 60 on and digitize these things, put them online, and people are asking me. So they're all on my website, which is arkanawada.com, and there's a, there's a place called Films, and then he, so they're all digitized, and they're really, really bad <laughs> in the early 1990s, but I'm putting it out there. Um, my father, my father, what I'm realizing about my dad is, what he was really saying was that he felt that women didn't get to fulfill their true potential as human beings because they would get sidetracked looking after other human beings, namely husbands and children. And for women, it is true, we tend to give everything to those other people and we tend to put ourselves second. And he's seen so many women you know, in his life do that. And he felt he didn't want that for his own daughter. And he felt, felt, felt the only way to do that was to exist children and husbands from my life. And then I would never have to put somebody else's life before mine. So I think when he, you know the show became a success and the books became a success, I think that's what he wanted. He just wanted to feel that as a woman, as a human being, that I was able to live up to my potential and I would never look back with regret and say, I wish I could have done these things. And, you know, I was really fortunate to marry a very supportive partner who, you know, always said to me that I will stay home and look after the kids and you go work. And he was, and he was true to his word. When Little Mosque happened, it was, I lived in Saskatchewan, they moved it to Toronto for political reasons. I had to live there for six months of the year, come home on weekends. And then people always ask me, well, how did you balance your career and your, and your family life? And the truth was, I was living in a condo in Toronto by myself for the weekend. He was the one handling the kids and the job, you know, and, and working part-time and turning. And it, so it helped having a partner that was really supportive, who viewed my career, you know, more important than my career, and was willing to put it on the line to help me um, make it happen. And so it was really important, that's why I tell women, really have those discussions with your partner and figure that out, because that stuff is so important. Like, how are you going to balance your family and your kids and, and work? Because and, it, it doesn't happen like magic. It's hard, hard negotiations, and you have to make some really hard decisions. And it helps to think about those things ahead of time. Um, the last question was, um, do you think more people immigrate to Canada? Canada? Yeah, we're getting them. We're getting people <coughs> crossing the border up in Quebec already. People, uh, we've had people losing fingers from frostbite because they're leaving the winter time and how cold it is. And they're coming because they're so afraid that they're going to be deported in the United States. And so they're going through our system. So it's already happening. It's the first time we've gotten Im immigration from the US because usually you know, people fly over, but people are walking to Canada. Um, and, and the Canadian government is, you know, going to process them in an orderly fashion. I think, I think, you know, our, we're really fortunate we have a, a prime minister. But you know what? Everyone's like, oh, you're so lucky, you're so lucky. But what people don't realize is before he was elected, we had eight years of Stephen Harper, who was a miniature Trump. He was, uh, he was Trump light, Canadian polite Trump, right? <laughs> <laughs> Not the advisor, but he was actually doing it in the Canadian way in terms of limiting immigration, othering Muslims, having speeches and saying Muslims and Islam, you know, Islam, it is how to say it properly, was the biggest threat to Canada, as if we were the biggest threat to Canada. And he said those things. And the, after eight years of him, the, Canada, the country was like fed up. Like they were fed up with him, and they're like, no, we will not stand for this. And the country mobilized and got rid of him. I don't think he, I think he was really shocked. Because no, Trudeau was not supposed to win according to the polls. And the way that Trump was not supposed to win, Trudeau was actually not scared. He was not expected to win. But everyone mobilized, young people, First Nations, minorities, everyone got together and said, we cannot have another four years of this man. He's destroying us as a nation. And he was wiped out. And so it's, it is possible. And sometimes it takes someone like Trump to re reignite people you know, and become part of the civic you know, movement of the country. And that's a good thing, because we need that. Because sometimes we need something to trigger us and say, you know what, we need real change. And that change is going to come from us. And we have to start paying attention and looking at our country and saying, we have to save this because this is worth saving. So that's my final words. Thank you. I want to point out that you are Manhattan College students and Manhattan College community, and we have so many resources here in terms of your questions. We have, of course, the Holocaust Genocide Faith Education Center. We have the Muslim Students Association. The president is sitting right here. She's trying really hard to build the organization. We have campus ministry. Don't forget we are Catholic, regardless of what we do. We have Kevin Ahern, the head of Peace Studies here. Um, we have all of these resources in this room. So if you want to change something, if you want to come just talk to any of us,
If you want to just knock on the door, if you want to come to events, we're here. We're here for you. This is why we're here at this call. So I want I wanted to say how lucky we are to have such great programs, have the resources. The luxury of thinking is amazing. So let us give, us another, give her another hand. would like to buy her book, they're outside, and she's going to be happy to sign them for you as you go outside. Thank you so much. Give the evaluations to Ria or Cami. Please complete the assessments so we can bring you better programming. I did it that last minute. I need to. And it's also nice to know. To know it. I think I was kind of terrified that she made the shout out. I'm still like, oh god, I'm going to go. Hey, how's it going? Hey, how's it going? Hey, how's it going? Hey, how's it going? Thank you.